Welcome to Little Things with Amber L.B. Swenson. This month, Time of Grace is talking about abortion. If you missed last week's episode, you may want to go back and listen to that before listening to today's episode. That's where we met Laura, who had an abortion as a young woman. But before we get started, let me mention that Time of Grace has a page of resources where you can find other content on abortion, including sermons from Pastor Mike, a Grace Talks devotional from Pastor Jeremy, and an interview I did with Pastor Mike on why he decided to do a sermon series on this important topic. Also, before we continue, I need to mention there are some descriptions of Laura's abortion which may trigger you if you've had an abortion yourself, or others may find slightly graphic. If you or someone you know is struggling to better understand the topic of abortion through God's Word, we're here to help. Visit timeofgrace.org slash abortion for more resources on this important topic. you're listening right now and anything Laura said just hit home and you're thinking damaged goods and yeah you're right I don't I don't deserve anything better Um, understand that Christ paid for every sin and that you are loved and cherished and that there's new life in in Jesus and you found that Laura what was the path that started taking you to healing. How did that come about? Again, I had been raised in the church, but I didn't understand anything about it. And really, as a child, my picture of God was like he, that he was sitting up in heaven on a throne with a lightning bolt in his hand, waiting to zap me every time I did something wrong. You know, that, that was my picture. And not that that came from anything, anyone teaching me that in church or anything. That was just something that I came up with. And, and yet I was so distraught and I was so desperate for some kind of, for some kind of help that even though I believed that God could never possibly forgive me because I was just so bad, I went to church and I began going regularly and that was a few years after the abortion and it it was out of desperation, even though I didn't think I deserved it. And even though I convinced myself that I wouldn't find any kind of absolution or anything, because how could you, that that was where I did turn. And that was a defining moment, because that was when I began to see that God doesn't leave me sitting in my past. He doesn't leave me sitting in those choices. He wants to walk with me and write a new story. And, and start happier chapters in my life. So statistics tell us that not quite half of women who have an abortion are regular church attendees. You found healing and comfort there. Somehow there's a disconnect with young women, and I think this goes back to what you were talking about at the very beginning. So There's a disconnect not realizing that these same women sitting in the church pews are women who can help you and can support you. What do you think about that statistic, and and what can we do about that? I think there's a couple things that that bring that statistic to, to where it is. I think a lot of churches are afraid to talk about abortion. I think a lot of churches think that the only way they can talk about abortion is politically. They don't understand that they can talk about the destruction that abortion brings 
to women, to the children, and that they can do it in a loving way so that they can communicate, number one, to women who may be in that position or soon to be in that position, but also to women who are, like I was, after the fact, trying to find some kind of comfort. And I also honestly think quite a few churches don't want to talk, they're afraid people are going to stop giving money if they talk about something, because it is so controversial. But there are definitely ways you can talk about abortion from the pulpit that communicate God's compassion and his love, and that he wants to help us no matter what situation we're in. And he wants to help us find the most loving and godly way out of it, even though we're deep in the, the mess. He wants to pull us up out of that, so that we don't keep more bad choices on the bad choices we've already done. I think also a lot of it is that self-shame that we put that we put on ourselves that we don't want to disappoint somebody, we don't want we don't want somebody to think badly of us. And historically there have been so many times where the girl gets shame, the boy doesn't. And we need to talk about Number one, healthy relationships, healthy dating, healthy choices as kids. But we also need to talk about pornography and adultery and gambling and all the other sins that are much easier to hide. You know, you, you can't hide a pregnancy. That's one of the few ones that you really can't hide when you go to church on Sunday. But it's no worse a sin than about adultery or pornography or gambling or any or drinking or you know all of the other sins that we can do, and I think that's also something that the church needs to do. So that's one of the other things that a church can talk about is to come compassionately to all people who are sinning, all people who are making those choices, and not pick a few out to publicly shame people about, and and help people see that that shaming people doesn't produce anything godly. It doesn't, all it does is drive people down deeper into poor choices. Yeah, and we let's, want to lift people up. let's look at what Jesus did. You know, the woman caught in adultery was brought to him. Not the man. So it was the woman. It was on the woman. It could have been dealt with privately, but the leaders didn't want to make it a private issue. They wanted, you know, to embarrass this woman and bring her there and and Jesus said, okay, whoever's without sin, you you cast the first stone. And you are absolutely right. A young woman or a woman who's even middle-aged or anyone in a, um, facing an unexpected pregnancy may feel like, well, when I go to church, everybody's going to know. They're going to see. Um, Jesus sees everything. And if he didn't cast the woman away, I, I love to think that those of us who are in the church are not going to either. So I hope that um, young women, middle-aged women, whoever um, would give people in the church a chance to come alongside them. What, if anything, do you think anything would have changed your mind to keep you from getting an abortion at any point between finding out you're pregnant and when you got the abortion? If I had let myself confide in someone or if someone along the way had helped me see that, okay, so I was 19, 20, right on that break point, that a pregnancy is a, for a period of time and that didn't necessarily mean that my life had to go a specific way, that there that I could I could move beyond that. And yes, I would be ashamed if everyone knew. But that was temporary. Because abortion is permanent. It is permanent and there's a there's a proverb that I heard a long time ago that old sins have long shadows. And that is a perfect descriptor of abortion because it has lifelong consequences that are destructive, whereas if, if you give birth and, and choose to make an adoption plan, 
or you choose to parent, those, those are uplifting and healthy choices. Abortion is shame-filled and destructive. And the destruction doesn't just stop with the woman. There's also destruction for the man. I've talked to many fathers and know many fathers who are post-abortive. And that same shame and destruction, even fathers who said, you have to get the abortion, here's money for it, they end up just as destroyed inside. And more are speaking out, but it's that long term that goes on and on. My daughters now don't have a sibling. My parents don't have a grandchild. My granddaughter doesn't have an aunt or an uncle. And so it's a, it's a much broader impact than we can ever imagine when we're 19 and all we can see is, you know, as far as the nose on our face, we can't see any further than that. It, it's a much longer term. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get post-abortive counseling? Yes. So after I was going to church, and for a while there I even decided that, you know, oh, I, well, God says he forgives, and so I must be okay now. And then I, I did hear about a post-abortion Bible study called Forgiven and Set Free, and decided to go, kind of with the idea that I could help other women, like I was okay by then, and we started going through this, and it was the first time for any of us, it was brand new, and before we got to, I think, the third week, we all said, well, <laughs> we need this for ourselves, and I, I particularly, there's multiple different um, healing programs now, but that one is my favorite, it, because it is thoroughly grounded in scripture. There are so many, when, when women go through it, we tell them to get the Bible with the tabs because they're flipping back and forth between them through the Bible so much they, they, they got to know the Bible really well or have those tabs. So it's thoroughly grounded in Scripture. And so everything, every step of the way is based with a foundation of Scripture. And what the study does is it walks you through the grieving process. And it helps you grieve your child. And it helps you grieve the choices that you made and the people that you hurt, including yourself. And it helps work through that process of grief. When someone else dies, you know, in our life, there's a funeral and people come alongside us and they cook for us and they tell us we're so sorry and they remember on the anniversary and, and, and there's none of that. An abortion, and yet you have lost a person just like if you lost another family member. So that Bible study helps you go through that grieving process. And as a matter of fact, you are now facilitating that Bible study for other women, correct? Yes, yes I have off and on throughout the years since then. So I've gone through, I can't count how many times I've gone through it now. And all those times going through it have helped me too because it's really like an onion when you peel off and you find out oh, there's another layer, there's something else, or some other truth that I connected from scripture to healing to how to work through this. So if there's a woman who is listening and she recognizes that this is something she needs, how do you go about finding that in your community? So right now they could contact me, and I'm doing it through my church, where I can meet with women, right? Um, there are a couple other places or avenues where they could um, also do the Bible study. There's also a couple other, it, not just that, there's also a program that is a weekend retreat, where it basically goes through a lot of that same process in a weekend. The Bible study that I do, it, it's 10 weeks, once once a week. So some people can do one or the other. And you know, I could connect anybody with that. Excellent. What do you say to the woman right now who's listening? She might be married. Maybe she's not. She's in a relationship that she shouldn't have been in. Or that is abusive. Or that's 
not what she would hope for. She knows the man is never going to marry her. She found out she's pregnant. He doesn't want the baby. What would you tell that woman right now? I would just say stop. Don't, don't make any fast decisions. And really understand you're not alone. There are so many people who want to help you. And there are pregnancy help centers all over now. They're all over the country. And their whole focus is helping women through pregnancies and um, young childhood to give them support, to give them a, a foundation and a, and a springboard to be able to move on with life. And most women do choose to parent their child, but they also do, will help you set up a, an adoption plan, make an adoption plan if that's what you decide to do. But the long-term, lifelong impact of that short-term sacrifice of going through with the pregnancy after a child is born, you don't have that destruction, that shame, that guilt. You've, you've given life, and that it puts your life on such a better trajectory than the impact of abortion and how it destroys things. So, Laura, you had mentioned nightmares. What were those nightmares like? How often did they come? What brought them on? They started as I was, when I was trying to not think about the abortion because I wanted to stop the feelings because I wanted to believe that it was all over. The waiting room, when I went to the abortion clinic, that was sat in beforehand was this dark, ratty room that had, it was all like darker blue carpet, darker blue furniture. I had pictures on the walls were some kind of a darker blue and just all ratty. And when I started having nightmares, and again, it took me a very long time to connect it, like with the vacuum, I didn't connect it back. But my nightmares all were that I something had blown into pieces and was all over this blue carpet that I had to pick up all these pieces out of this blue carpet and put it all back together. And that nightmare I would have over and over and over again. And obviously now looking back and after I came through healing, I could see that it was my mind wanting to put my baby back together again. And it was connecting with that dark, awful blue room that we waited in. And it wasn't until I went through the healing Bible studies that those nightmares stopped. And I stopped having those because I came to a point of realizing that my baby was whole and with Christ and not where I needed to put him back together again. Tell me about how it happens that are there days when it just sort of hits you that you had an abortion? Does it sort of come out of the blue sometimes or does something trigger it now? You said you've worked through the vacuum, you've worked through the dentist, but does it ever just show up on a day when you think about that child or? It does. It does. And, and there are many things that will bring it up. But oftentimes when I, I feel like it was a boy. And so when I see a mother with a son, that makes me think of it. And throughout the you know, some, it's just little things that will make me think of it. Obviously, the dates, the date that the abortion, the date that he would have been born, those oftentimes um, will come up, and sometimes I'm halfway through the day, and I think, oh, that was today. And, and then I stop and think about it a bit. And it's a grieving that I think you go through for the rest of your life. Um, not that many years ago, I lost my brother to an accident. And I think it's accepted and people understand 
I'll always grieve and miss my brother. But that also happens with the baby that I aborted. I will always grieve and I will always miss him and the relationship that we could have had. And then as I've moved through life and when my oldest daughter had her child, that really brought up a whole lot again that I won't have grandchildren from that child. And I had to go through that grieving process again. And I think you just keep going through stages of that grieving process. I think that's important that you said that uh, about the grandchild because um, in parenting teens and young adults, I I have one of my children has been in a long-term relationship for just about coming up on three years now. And the last summer I made a point to have a talk with this child about, you know, I don't know where in the relationship you are. You know, we've tried to walk alongside you and, and let you know, you know, this is the, the path of blessing and, and, and so on and so forth. But I said, I just really want you to know that if something happens, I want to know my grandchildren. So I'd like you to come talk to me. And I, I, I don't want to hear 20 years later that there was an abortion. And it's a hard conversation to have because you want your children to make all the right choices, right? And yet on the same token, I just felt as we were getting to this place in the relationship and having young adult children that, like you said, as a 19-year-old, your split-second decisions thinking, oh, they would never let me get away with this, or they would hate me, or they would be so disappointed, or they would, again, a short-term decision instead of letting the people in your life come around you and say, you know, it may not have happened the way we would have liked but now there's a child involved. So we want we want this child and we want to come alongside you. Right. Absolutely. And I I would wish for all parents of teenage kids to have that conversation and tell them. Because I never gave my parents that opportunity. And I think now they would have said just what you said. It's not how we wanted it to happen. But there's a child now, and we want to know that child. So when you're when you when that date comes up and you think about it, or when some when you see that mom with a son, what is your process of grieving? I give myself time to explore what kind of emotions are coming up. Um, I've been able to leave the anger behind, um, but I was very very angry for a long time. And that was destructive to my life as well. So I I just really work on what am I feeling today? How am I feeling about it? And then I will do something where I can just stop and pause, whether it's go to a park or light a candle at home that night or something to acknowledge the memory and acknowledge the grief. And, and I'll also talk to friends about it because now, you know, as much as I tried to hide it from everyone, now most everyone I know knows about it and also knows what I do to try to help people not be in that same position. So now I have the freedom where I can talk to other friends about it, what, if I'm feeling sad one day or not. Huge to have people to walk through this with. Whatever I mean, we've talked about how important it is for us to come alongside women who are facing an unexpected preg- pregnancy, but I'm hearing you say it's equally important that we come alongside these women who may be struggling and traumatized from an abortion they had 2, 10, 20 years ago. Exactly. We, we can sit in a pew or in a women's Bible study and not really have any, you know, if you haven't gone through that particular struggle, not really understand that it's highly likely that there's at least one other one woman in that group that has experienced abortion. And to be aware of that, to be 
to be someone who is accessible that someone might confide in and say, I, I went through this and I'm hurting and can I just talk to you about it? So obviously your abortion was a big part of your life and it affected you in a lot of ways. Do you do anything to honor the baby that was aborted? I always, on the, the date that he would have been born, I always make a point to do something to remember him. But on a day-to-day basis, a lot of what I speak out and what I share my testimony is to honor him. Is there a verse or a section of the Bible that you go to to find comfort when you're grieving? because God can redeem us from the pit. He does. Thank you so much for your time and for your courage and for your transparency and for the work that you are doing and continue to do with women in the community and in the church to, to bring healing to them. And we will be sure to have a link to set up um, so that people can communicate with you if they need to, to get direction and um, so that you can connect them with that Bible study. So thank you again, Laura, for being with us. If you or someone you know is struggling to better understand the topic of abortion through God's word, we're here to help. Visit timeofgrace.org abortion for more resources on this important topic.